If you're down in St. Croix, over in Texas, out in Taiwan, wherever you are, just shout it out real quick so we can say what's up to you. We're glad that the St. Paul family is diverse and spread across the world because this is what we know. This isn't a local ministry. This isn't a regional ministry. This isn't a national ministry. This is a worldwide ministry of getting the word of God to the people of God, and we're happy to serve in that direction. I hope you've been having a fabulous week, and I hope this kicks off your week for next week even greater than because you know we're in the season of greater than. Let's pray together right now. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that you've been blessing us and keeping us. But God, we thank you for this season of greater than. We thank you that you're expanding our horizons, that you're expanding our faith, that you're lighting our faith on fire again. But God, right now, we ask you to bless those who are watching and bless those who are connected. Right now, God, we ask you to step into their situations, step into their homes, step into their jobs, step into whatever situation is falling on them. Because God, right now, we need you more than ever. So God, right now, I ask you to step into sick rooms, to step into hospitals. Lord, I ask you in the cases where it's needed to give financial breakthrough. And Lord, I ask you to give in every case protection from hurt, harm, and danger. God, you're our caring God. You're our loving God. And you're our keeping God. And we ask you, Lord, and we thank you for the keeping that you've done. And we ask you for the keeping that you're going to do. So Lord, right now. Prepare our hearts and prepare our minds so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's get started with some praise and worship. Well, come on, let's lift up a sound of praise in this place, wherever you are. Come on, let the glory of the Lord, it says, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord.
Amen. That was absolutely wonderful. Speaking of wonderful, an amazing thing happened at the church this week. As you all know, at the St. Paul Church, we have ministries to fight in food insecurity in our area. Two of those ministries are our St. Paul Food Pantry on Thursdays and our partnership with Trader Joe's on Fridays. On Thursdays, if you need food or know someone that does, give us a call here at the church at the number below to set up an appointment to get a distribution from the St. Paul Food Pantry. That goes on on Thursdays. On Fridays, we do our Trader Joe's Produce and Fresh Foods giveaway at on Friday at 3 p.m. You don't need an appointment. You just need to show up. It's given out first come, first serve at 3 p.m. on Fridays. That's how we feed the community. But here's the thing. What many of you don't know is that there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make our food pantry and our Trader Joe's giveaway possible. This Monday, as we were receiving food for the food pantry to restock the pantry to give out food this week, there was a gentleman walking by and he saw us at work. When he saw us at work, he wasn't hungry, at least not for food. He needed something else. He needed prayer. And when he was walking by the church, he found the people of God doing earthly work, but prepared to do spiritual work. So our volunteers prayed with him, blessed him, and sent him on his way. St. Paul, I tell you that story because I want you to know two things. One, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into making our ministry happen. But two, I want you to know that all of the earthly work that we do to fight food insecurity is also a beacon of hope for the heavenly work of us being able to teach Bible studies and pray with people on the spot. I want to commend and thank our food pantry volunteers. Right oh, guys, you did a wonderful job this week of both feeding the community, but also blessing souls. Listen, along with blessing souls through prayer that we did that day on the spot, you know we pray faithfully here at the St. Paul Church on our St. Paul prayer call. The St. Paul prayer call is Monday through Friday at 7.30 a.m. To be a part of the prayer call, all you've got to do is dial in on the prayer line, which is 605-313-5874, and use access code 390060. There's no better way to start your day than in prayer and praise with the people of the St. Paul Church. So join us 7.30 a.m. Monday through Friday for the St. Paul Prayer Call. Along with prayer, you know we study scripture. This week, our devotional is called Faith Over Everything. Faith over everything simply means that we want to put our faith as the paramount thing. Our faith over our fears. Our faith over our worries. Our faith over our troubles. When you put your faith first, it puts everything else in perspective and allows us to realize that as long as we've got faith and it's on fire, everything else will take care of itself. To join this week's devotional, all you got to do is go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and under the Ministries tab, click Current Devotional. Or on Monday, when the e-blast comes out, the devotional link will be right in there for your convenience. We want you to be a part of everything going on at the church, including the devotionals. Along with the devotionals, we're also back in Bible study. We had a wonderful Bible study this Wednesday as we start our study of seeking the kingdom of God through the book Seek First by Dr. Jeremy Tree. We're making one small change to our Bible study this week. You won't have to register for Bible study anymore. Our Bible study is going to be live on the St. Paul website. So join us at 7 p.m. on the St. Paul website at www.stpauloxenhill.org and you'll find us live right there. You'll also find us streaming live on our YouTube page. Either one of those is available for you. So if you've got the book, read on ahead. If you don't have the book, just tune in. You'll learn a lot even without the book. But we want you to be a part of not only our daily devotionals, but our Bible studies on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We want to see you there. I want to thank all of you for your faithful giving to the St. Paul Church. Listen, your faithful giving makes a huge difference. Your faithful giving allows our ministries to be strong, and when we have strong ministries, you never know how God is going to bless us. We weren't expecting to have to pray for that gentleman on Monday, but because we were here doing work and doing ministry, preparing for what we were going to be doing later, God gave us a chance in the right then to be a blessing to somebody. 
Listen, we are blessed to be a blessing. We're blessed to be a blessing through our prayers. We're blessed to be a blessing through our service, but we're also blessed to be a blessing through our giving. I want to thank all of you who are faithfully giving, and I want to encourage all of you, give abundantly, give robustly, so that we can have abundant, robust ministries at the St. Paul Church that make a difference in the right now and a difference in the hereafter. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our minds. Let's prepare right now to give faithfully and abundantly in our morning offering. It's offering time in the house of God. Here at the St. Paul Church, there are multiple ways that you can give. You can give by clicking on the link on the screen in front of you. You can also give by going to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and pressing the Give tab. You can give by using your cell phone by using the Givelify app. On the Givelify app, all you've got to do is search for St. Paul Church in Oxen Hill, and you'll find a picture of me and a picture of the church so you know you're giving to the right place. And then in three easy, secure steps, you can give directly to the St. Paul Church. Last but certainly not least, you can always mail your tithes and offerings to the St. Paul Church. All you've got to do is mail them to St. Paul Church, 6634 St. Barnabas Road, Oxen Hill, Maryland, 20745 Attention Finance Ministry. Any of those ways will let you bless God and bless the church. And we know the Bible tells us, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your hearts to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, let's give abundantly unto the Lord. Spirit break out Break our walls down Spirit break out Yeah And heaven come down Come on sing with me Spirit break out Break our walls down. We surrender all. Spirit, break out. And heaven come down all around us. Our Father, all of heaven rose your name. Sing loud. This place he rubbed with bread. Can you hear the sound of heaven touching good?
Listen, I hope you're still joining me every day as we repeat our greater than scripture from John chapter 14, verse 12, which simply says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will be do, will do the works that I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the father. You know, our season of greater than continues because I believe that God wants to do greater in us so that he can do greater through us so that there can be greater in the world because of God and us. And I've told you already, we're in this month in a series of sermons called Faith on Fire. Now, I believe that we have to keep our faith on fire so that we can see greater than and do greater than. They're interconnected with one another. God keeps our faith and wants our faith on fire because when your faith is on fire, you can do, see, and be greater than. So today, I just want to talk from the topic, you've got to see it. You've got to see it. Interestingly enough, you know, you don't, you're never prepared. Can I be, can I be transparent? You're never prepared for some of the changes that having a child gives you because nobody tells you about them ahead of time. One of the changes that my wife and I were not prepared for were the changes in our television viewing habits. You know, it wasn't that we watched anything crazy, but we just watched interesting stuff. You know, we might get into power every now and then. We might get into, uh, you know, Godfather of Harlem. We would watch all kinds of stuff. But now, when we're watching TV, we realize that we have to watch things that are both mutually agreeable and non-offensive because there's a little guy sitting next to us watching everything that we watch and repeating everything that he hears. Can you imagine your five-year-old reciting lines from the, from the TV show Power or reciting things that he heard in The Godfather or worse yet, Scarface? That's not what you want. So Aaron and I have started, we, we watch mutually agreeable, but also unoffensive things, which means that we watch a lot of HGTV. That's right. We have gone from stars and Netflix to HGTV. And what we, have wa what we watch on HGTV is a lot of the before and after shows. I'm a huge fan of the Property Brothers. My wife loves Chip and Joanna Gaines and Fixer Upper. And what we love about these shows are the before and after effects. Now, this is what I've noticed because we watch so much HGTV. All of these shows are the same, they just have different hosts. And what you get with these shows, if you've seen any of them, I'm not, no spoiler alert, is how they all work. You get people who need a house or want a house and they want a dream house, but they don't have dream money. So they get with the Property Brothers or they get with Chip and Joanna and Chip and Joanna show them these houses that are a mess, but then they have a vision for what they can be. And before the show is over, these are the things that happen every time. They start off with a mess, they work through it, they find something wrong that they have to fix, and then they get back into developing the dream, and by the end, what was a vision in the beginning is reality at the end. But here's what always gets me. The same people every week who have hired Chip and Joanna, who have gotten on the Property Brothers, they can never see the vision. Because they're always standing in a house that's a mess or a house that's too small or something that doesn't live up to their standards. While they're saying, I don't see it, the Property Brothers and Chip and Joanna are always saying, but you've got to see the vision. You've got to see what it can be. And here's the thing. I believe that many of us are living lives based on sight when we should be basing our lives on vision. Here's the problem. Sight and vision are not the same thing. Too often, we believe that sight and vision were the same thing because we think they both come from our eyes. But that's simply not true. I want to show you. Um, sight is simply what you see with your eyes. It is the light that comes in through your eyes, then sends a signal to your brain and tells you what's right in front of you. By contrast, vision may not be in front of you. It may be something that's down the road, down the line, and something that something can be. This is what I want you to see. Too many of us are depending on sight and missing vision. We're depending on what we see right now 
and not seeing beyond it and planning for what God can do with a little bit of faith. Remember, one of our base scriptures for this series, Faith on Fire, is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which simply says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Be very clear. Your faith should give you both sight and vision. Your faith has to see what is, but also see what can be. And I want to talk to somebody very directly right now. I want you to know you're sitting in what is, but you've got to get a vision of what can be. You're sitting in what is. You see your problems. You see your issues. You see all the things going on, but you've got to get a vision for what can be. You've got to get a vision for what God can do. You've got to get a vision for what it'll look like once all of this gets fixed up. And too many of us, watch this, we get stuck at what we see with our sight and we lose our vision. I'm going to show you what I mean. How many of us had big, bright hopes when we were kids, but by the time we became adults, we tried to manage our expectations. When we manage our expectations, what we have said is, I just don't think that's possible. So because of what I'm seeing, because of what I'm going through, I'm going to revise what God inspired me with originally. I want you to know, if you have a vision from God, if God has shown you a life, if God has shown you a ministry, if God has shown you some things, that is the inspirational seed that God is planting in you to drive you forward. But too many of us, watch this, we haven't planted that seed, we buried that seed. Pastor, aren't planting and burying the same thing? Absolutely not. When you bury something, you don't expect it to ever do anything. You get rid of it, you cover it up so you can't see it. But when you plant something, you expect something to grow out of it. You nurture it, you water it, you make sure it gets light, sun, fertilizer, and all the things that are necessary for the plant to not just be a seed, but to grow into a sprout and then to bear fruit. What I want you to know is when we have sight, we will often bury what God has put in us. But when we have vision, we will cultivate what God has put into us so that it can grow into something that benefits the world. And I want you to know the thing about sight is that sight is limited to what is. Vision is unlimited by what is because vision is based on what can. And if you've got God on your side, what will be. Here it is. God is a God of vision. God is not a God of sight. God is a God of vision because God sees what can be and what will be because God knows that when he speaks it, it becomes what it's supposed to be. And too many of us don't trust God's vision and God's provision. Can I help you? Vision is what you see. Provision is giving you what you need for what you'll see. And this is the thing about God. Your faith has to remind you that God sees what's ahead, puts it in you, and gives you the ability to get where you're going. Vision sees a future that is not yet. But a future that is not yet is a future that is just as real. If we have real vision for our lives and real vision from God, it sets a course for our lives to become what God has had in mind for us from the beginning. Can I tell you, I want who I am to line up with what God thinks of me. I want who you are to line up with what God thinks of you. And here's the issue. Many times, God thinks more of us than we do of ourselves. I'm not telling you to be arrogant. I'm not telling you to be boastful. I'm telling you that God sees more in you than you see in yourself sometimes. How do I know? I'm in good Bible ground. God saw Abraham, an old man who had a barren wife, and saw him as a father of many nations. God saw Moses, a killer who was on the run, and saw him as a liberator of a nation. God saw Gideon, a coward who was hiding in a wine press, and saw him as a mighty warrior who would free his people. God saw David, a shepherd boy, but said he's got something in him that puts him after my own heart and saw him as a king. Jesus saw Peter. Peter, a loud mouth. Peter who popped off. 
Peter who got scared. And Jesus saw him and said, you're the rock that I can build my church on. I want you to know what God sees of you is the vision of who you should be, can be, and will be if you make your vision for life agree with God's vision for life. Here's the problem. Too many of us have let sight limit vision. Everybody that you go through in the Bible, they, they were stuck by sight until they heard from God and got vision. Because here's the thing. When you start moving in vision, you will start moving. Here it is. I want to help somebody. When you start moving by vision, it starts to direct your path. It starts to show you the way. Sight requires eyes. Vision requires faith. Sight sees what is. Vision sees what can be. But here's the thing. Vision with faith sees what can be and what will be. Here's the thing. I want you to understand. Don't stop at can. Faith requires will. Faith requires that you go from can you do it, which is possible, to will you do it which is making it a reality. And too many of us are trapped in can. This is one of the things that I get, that my wife and I go back and forth about all the time. Uh, my wife will say, can you go do something? And my response to her is always, yes, I can. And the reason for that is, when you have a preacher and a lawyer living in the same house, you got two people who deal with words and their explicit definitions all the time. So when my wife asks me, can I do something that I don't want to do? I say, yes, I can, which means I absolutely have the ability to do. Just answering the question that was asked. So she automatically says, will you go do it now? Because... She now is asking the question to get to the answer that she wants. Because the answer that she wants is, are you going to get up, go downstairs, get that laundry, take it out of the dryer, put it in the basket, bring it back upstairs so it can get stored until we fold it? Because y'all know you take stuff out of the dryer all the time. It takes a good seven to ten business days before it all gets folded. It ain't just me. Can versus will. And here's what I want you to know. God knows what you can do. The question is, will you do it? Will you have the faith to align your life with what God sees so that you can move forward from the ability to, and, and this word gets used wrongly so often, I hate to use it, but I have to, the manifestation of what God is doing. And this is why I say it gets used wrongly, because now we keep saying, I'm manifesting, which means I'm dreaming. You, manifesting requires work. When God wants you to manifest, he wants you to get off your dairy air and start moving in the direction that he has given you for your life to create what God sees in you, out of you, into the real world. I want you to know, your vision should be worked towards so that it can become a reality. But to do that, you've got to believe it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10 say this. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and be at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Understand, the, the verse that we quote all the time is verse 7. For, for we live by faith and not by sight. And, you know, the other version from the King James, for we walk by faith and not by sight. But when you put it in context, Paul is saying you actually have to do something to walk by faith and not by sight. Look what he's saying you have to do. He says, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from him. 
What, what he's saying is when we walk by faith and not by sight, we're walking by the faith that one day we will be rewarded for the works that we have done. When we're walking by faith, we put our faith on fire in action so that when we get to the judgment seat, that's what Paul says, and we have to give account for what we've done, whether we are in body or not in body, what we do will be accounted for. Look what Paul says. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Your faith has to push your vision into your doing so that you will do in body what God has called you to. So you will do in faith what God has put before you. But you've got to have a vision of more than what is right now so that you can see what is to come. Because your faith must lead you into the walking and living that Christ has called you to. If we're going to live by faith, we live by what we believe and it informs everything that we do. When your faith informs everything that you do, watch this. There's some things you can't do because it doesn't line up with who you are. Too many of us, here's the problem with sight versus vision. Sometimes your sight will get you off track from the vision. Because you'll start seeing stuff and you'll start saying, I can't do that no more. I'm not going to get there no more. But if that vision is there and you align your life and you align your living and you're walking in the direction of the faith that has come from the vision that God has given you, watch this. As you walk, everything you do will be informed by what you believe. In other words, I run decisions, I run actions through the filter of my faith and I don't do it if it don't line up. Too many of us. are getting short-term rewards for stepping out of faith and not realizing the long-term sacrifices. We're getting short-term rewards because if I do this right now, I can get this. But if you align with what God is saying, you can get that. And I will tell you this, when you align what you're saying with God, that is always bigger than this. That is always better than this. And here's what Paul says, and the goal is to please God. Hebrews eleven six, without faith, it is impossible to please God, which means that with faith informing our actions so that we move forward in the things of God, we will be pleasing unto God. But here's the thing I want you to understand. You don't want to be all sight or all vision because here's the problem. People who are all sight can't see anything beyond what's right in front of them. People who are all vision can't navigate the present day. You have to see your here and now and your hereafter simultaneously. In other words, you have to be able to acknowledge and deal with what's going on now and navigate it to get to what you see down the road. We talked about this with the yet faith. Our yet faith says, this is going on, yet I will still do this. This is going on and what I want hasn't happened yet, but I'll keep going because of that. When you do that, it moves you into a way that you can live by faith and live by vision because you have to do both and at the same time. Don't be so sight-based that you get stuck. Don't get so vision-based that you can't get past what's in front of you. Best version of this, one of the best versions of this that I've seen in the Bible comes from the story of Nehemiah. Book of Nehemiah is about a man by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was an exile. He was a, he was a Hebrew, an Israelite, but he was born during the exile and he was born away from Jerusalem. He's risen to the point where he's become the king's cupbearer while living in exile. And some people from Jerusalem come back. He says, how are things back in Jerusalem? What's going on back there? Now, according to the Bible, Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. He just knows Jerusalem because it's, it's home. It's, it's, the, it's the city of God. It's where God's people are. And also he knows his Bible that says that there will be a time when the people will be exiled and there will be a time when they will come back to faith and come back to Jerusalem. He's never been to Jerusalem, but he asked about Jerusalem to see how things are going. And this is the report he gets. It's a hot mess. Let me take it a step further. It's a hot, fiery mess. The city is in shambles. The gates have broken down. 
The walls have fallen. The place is completely unprotected. Brother, it's a mess. Now, you got to understand, gates in ancient times and walls in ancient times were the defense of the city. You, you stop people from coming in and going out because you had gates and you had walls. If you didn't have those things, the city was unprotected from its enemies. And Nehemiah hears this and the Bible says he becomes greatly saddened. He becomes disillusioned, disheartened. So much so that while he's doing his job, the king notices. The king says to him, you, you've never been this downcast in front of me. What, what's going on, bro? Because here's the thing. When you're in front of the king, you're supposed to be happy. Just happy to be there, happy to be in front of the king, happy to hang out. I'm just here. I'm happy to do this. And Nehemiah is the cupbearer, which means that he tastes the king's wine to make sure ain't nobody punishing. Ain't nobody trying to poison the king. Now, let me just say something. That works as a good job if everybody likes the king. If it ain't a king that people like, that's that a risky proposition. Because the king is like, I'll drink that in five. You drink that, I'll drink it in five minutes. Let's just watch. But now his job is to be happy and excited in front of the king. And the king says, what's wrong? He says, my, my, my hometown, Jerusalem. It's in shambles. Uh, and it makes me sad. And the king asks him, what do you want to do? Nehemiah says, I want to go back and fix it. King says, okay, what else do you need? Nehemiah does the big ass. Can, can you um, send some notes so that I can get safe passage and have wood so I can have all the supplies that I need when I get there so I can rebuild the walls and then I'll come back? This is what he asked him. Now, now here's the thing. Understand, Nehemiah has a vision and God provides provision. Because here's the thing. Nehemiah has no money. He ain't got no Amex, he ain't got no visa, he can't go charging up a whole bunch of timber. He asked the king, who has no reason to help him, would you do this? And the king is moved and says, you got everything you need. And Nehemiah heads off to Jerusalem to start rebuilding. And here, I will pick up in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11. Look what the Bible says. Nehemiah says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. I hadn't told anybody the vision yet. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. In other words, I'm the only one with a horse. Ain't nobody even got a horse. Here it is. Nehemiah is there three days, watch this, looking around. He's heard, but he's looking around. And he sees what everybody else saw. This is what I want you to understand about the difference between sight and vision. Everybody saw the same thing. That sight. Nehemiah showed up with a plan to do something and make it better. That's vision. That is the difference empirically between sight and vision. Everybody else had seen the same thing. In three days, he had a plan for making it better. There are too many people who can see a problem and won't do nothing about it. They will see a problem and not get involved. They will see a problem. Everybody can see the problem. Nehemiah said, I've got a vision for it to be better. Now, here's the thing. He also ain't telling nobody because sometimes you can't tell folk what God has put on your heart. I want to help somebody who's hiding the vision that God has given them for their lives because somebody told you you can't do it. Because somebody told you you weren't good enough. Because somebody told you folk from here never get that. That never happens for people like us. You got to be X for that to happen. You got to be Y for that to happen. Don't tell everybody your stuff. Sometimes you got to plan, develop, and pray. You got to plan, write out what you need, develop, put that plan together step by step, and then pray knowing that God hears you, God sees you, and God will move you. He doesn't tell everybody because everybody don't have the same vision. Make sure that you are not spending all your time with sight people because here's the thing about sight people. You know you're dealing with sight people versus vision people because sight people see it and can tell you what's wrong with it and complain about it, but they don't do anything about it. That's sight people. Vision people see the problem and say, I've got to do something. We've got to make this better. We've got to make this God honoring. Here it is. Complaints are recognition of a problem. 
Vision is recognition of a plan. Recognition without faith is complaining. Recognition with faith is vision. Nehemiah had a vision and he walked around with folk and he said, it's bad, but I think I got something. Pick it up in verse 13. Look what it says. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal, towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and reentered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or anyone who would be doing the work. Here it is. This is what I want you to understand about your vision so that you don't get it off track, so that you don't get it messed up. Every vision needs an incubation period. What's an incubation period? There has to be a time when it's just you, the vision, and God. There has to be a time when it's just you, what God is saying, and what y'all are planning. Too often we'll jump out because we want to tell folk we're excited. I understand you're excited. I understand that God has put something on your heart. But God uses the incubation period, watch this, to light your faith on fire because there will be Pitfalls, challenges, problems, and opposition. The incubation period is to get you so fired up, so well planned, so enthused, so attuned, aligned, and connected to the vision that when problems, opposition, and trouble show up, you can power through them. Because let me tell you something. If you're going to do something for God, if you're going to live out a vision, if you're going to have a vision for your life, if you're going to have a vision for your family, if you're going to have any vision, there will be problems, challenges, opposition, and trouble. All of those come with it. And here's the problem. Too many times, we don't expect what we should be expecting. But give an example. You know, there are a lot of folk who want to be CEO of a company. They want to be C-suite, top level. They want large and in charge. They want to be H-N-I-C. They want to do that thing. And here's the problem many times. You have people standing at the bottom of the mountain who can see the top of the mountain, but they can't see the mountain. Here's the mountain. The mountain is the work to get you from where you are to the fulfillment of where you're trying to be. And a lot of folk don't see the mountain. Nehemiah went around, assessed everything, and saw the mountain and still kept it to himself because it was still the incubation period. I want somebody to know that thinking about it, praying about it, planning about it, that is part of the process, but then you got to get moving on it. God doesn't give you a vision just to sit on. God gives you a vision to drive you. God gives you a vision to move you. And it's with faith that we keep driving, we keep moving, we keep going. And look what it says. Start picking up in verse 17. Then I said to them, incubation is over. This is what Nehemiah says. You see the trouble we're in. Got to acknowledge this. Nehemiah said, this is the mountain. You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. And I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start building. So they began this good work. Look at what Nehemiah says. He says, y'all see the problem. And they've been seeing the problem the whole time. But Nehemiah says, I've got a vision to do something about it. I've got a vision so that we're no longer in disgrace. Nehemiah is saying, it don't have to be like this. And I want to talk to you real quick. It don't have to be like this. What you're going through, what you're dealing with, no matter how long you've been going through it and how long you've been dealing with it, 
It don't have to be like this. It can be better. You can be whole. You can be healed. The question is, will you? Do you have a vision for wholeness, for healing, for breakthrough? Not a dream, a vision for the things that you're going to do because of what God has put you on your heart to get you there. Do you have the faith to fight through the problems, fight through the challenges, fight through the issues? Do you have the faith to keep going when times get hard? Because they are going to get hard. If you go through the rest of the story of Nehemiah, you'll find out they rebuild the wall. But along the way, they run into problems. They run into issues. Nehemiah runs into folk who lie on him. Folk who tried to kill him. Folk who tried to talk him out of the word. Folk who did all these things. And Nehemiah kept going because he stayed focused on the vision. People are going to talk. Problems are going to arise. But you got to see it. You got to see it. Remember, I told you. Those shows that Aaron and I watch, those home improvement shows, they always run into a problem. It's always, we got into the walls and we found out that the pipes were made out of Play-Doh and that, that, that's not legal. So we're gonna have to redo all the pipes. Well, what does that do to the budget? Well, Play-Doh cheap, copper expensive. We're gonna have to make some changes. We're gonna have to do some things. And here's the thing. They always say, but at the end, you'll have a house that you love. At the end, you'll have a house that can be your forever home. Yeah, we, 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 we have a vision. We ran into some trouble, but we're going to fight through that to get to the end. Why do I tell you that? <coughs> Because you're going to run into problems when you've got a vision. You're going to run into problems when you're serving God. You're going to run into problems when you're trying to do the things of God. And this is what 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 said. I want to give you this to encourage you along the way. Because you will have problems. You will have issues. You will have opposition. But you will still make it. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. Inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what's seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul is simply saying, yeah, when you got problems, when you got issues, when you got troubles, those are real and you can see them, but they're temporary. I want somebody to know what you're dealing with is temporary. What you're going through is temporary. So don't focus on it. You have to focus on the vision that God has and the vision that you have because that is eternal. That is what will keep you going. That is what will drive you. That is what will push you in those inevitable, hear me, inevitable, gonna happen. No way around them hard times. But when you keep them in perspective and you realize I'm not trusting sight, I'm trusting vision. You realize that they're temporary and that they are a light and small affliction. In other words, yeah, it ain't good, but I'm not paying attention to that. I'm keeping my eyes on what's unseen, not what is seen. Because what's unseen will be seen if I keep pushing through all of this. I want you to know, you've got to be guided by vision, not by sight. That means that you've got to be always looking ahead. So fix your eyes on what's, on what's unseen, not what's seen. In other words, don't wait. Stay focused. Know that these problems are temporary. They're going to be here today and gone tomorrow. But know that what God is doing is eternal. The vision that God has given you, the vision that God has for you is not today. It's everlasting. But my brother, but my sister, you've got to get past sight 
and get to vision. And none of it happens unless you see it. Hey, I hope that sermon enlivened your mind, opened your heart, and led you just a little bit closer to God. Listen, if the sermon had an effect on you, maybe that's God reaching out to you. Maybe that's God saying, it's time for you and I to connect. If you want more information about God, or if you want to be saved, or just get more information about being saved, or if you want prayer or to become a part of the St. Paul family, we just want you to go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and press the Contact Us button, and we'll get right back in contact with you for prayer, for salvation, or to be a part of the St. Paul family. Listen, let me ask you a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure that you know every time we put out a video so that you can be a part of the St. Paul family. And if you don't mind, copy the link and share it with some folk. If the word was great for you, the word will be great and a blessing to somebody else. If you enjoyed what we're doing, we'd love to have your support for the St. Paul Ministries. To support us, all you've got to do is go to our website, www.stpauloxenhill.org, and press the Give button. It doesn't matter if you give a lot or if you give a little, but all of your support helps, all of your support counts, and all of your support helps us spread the word of God. Thanks for joining us. Remember, hit that subscribe button, and now it's time for the Williams Weekly Challenge. The word of God tells us to not only be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. This week, I want to challenge you to do something difficult. And I know many times we don't like doing difficult things, but if you don't do the difficult work, you'll never get the great blessings of God. The difficult thing I want you to do this week is to sit down and hear from God so that you can set a vision for your life. Many of us are going in circles or spinning our wheels because we're not working and moving towards the vision that God has for our lives, largely because we've never taken the time to sit down and evaluate who am I, what can I do, and what is God calling me to? This week, take the time to set a vision for the future and watch God make it become reality. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next time.